Hello, I'm Gary Stearman. Welcome to Skywatch TV. Today, we're going to talk with author Josh Peck. He's written a couple of books, one called Quantum Creation. The other, other one is called Cherubim Chariots. But we're going to focus on the first book today, Quantum Creation. Uh, Josh Peck, welcome to Skywatch TV. Well, thank you so much for having me on. This is uh, an honor and a blessing for me. You are an interesting young man indeed. Uh, and I read your book, both of them, by the way, but we're going to focus on quantum creation. Uh, I think everybody knows what uh, the word creation means. Very few people would understand the word quantum, and that takes me uh, to a certain place that, uh, from which we'll launch today's discussion, quantum. There are a lot of words today, a lot of scientific terms that are popping up sort of behind the scenes and then suddenly they're out there and people say, what's that? Uh, does that have anything to do with my life? Uh, and, particular, and in particular, does it have anything to do with my life as a Christian? And that's exactly where you go in this book. Absolutely. Um, the, the term quantum is really the, the study of the smallest of the small. Um, we have particle physics and then we have quantum physics, which is under that. So what makes the particles? And I want to say right off the bat, too, that you don't have to be a genius to understand this stuff. I'm certainly not. I'm not a scientist or anything. I'm just, uh, I'm just a guy from southeast Michigan that just has an interest in this stuff. So um, when I really started to research this and realize this is available for everybody. Uh, something as seemingly complicated and convoluted as quantum physics, we have access to. And, and we should look at things like this as Christians because it's the study of God's creation. This is the literal building blocks oh. of, uh, of the creation itself. And it, it's just fascinating. He made it all. And of course, we believe that. <clears throat> he created the heavens and the earth, and that's everything. So when physicists come along, uh, and they have mathematical tools, they have observational tools, uh, they have, in fact, increasingly uh, precise ways of looking uh, at scientific questions, they come up with these terms, and, and what are they doing? They're trying to understand where we all came from. Now, you and I, as Christians, say, well, we know where we came from. We don't need to study that. And yet, there, really, there is a place for, for scientific understanding. And uh, let's talk for, for a bit about observation, scientific observation. You talk about a couple of things in your book, observation and interpretation. I think most people are familiar with those terms, but in the way that you use them, you bring out a lot of very interesting truth. Yeah. Well, th this is something that was taken from personal experience because for the longest time, you know, I, I was brought up in the church. So for the longest time, I thought science and religion are opposed. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't have any, any place with each other. But as it turns out, it's really just the interpretations of both that, uh, that sometimes oppose. The problem with scientific interpretation is um, a physicist or a scientist that is observing something, they will put their own interpretation on it. Uh, and then they'll call the whole thing science. But really just the observation is what we can, uh, what we can know is true. The, the interpretation they put on it, that's something that we need to be able to separate a, as Christians. And you know, we do that too with our, uh, with our, own, uh, our own Bibles. Uh, certainly in the field of eschatology and things like that, you know, we can have two or three different Christians read the same verse and get different meanings out of it. Mm -hmm. So that's, um, we, we can observe one verse, yet we put our own interpretations on it. So uh, science, in a sense, scientists and physicists are doing the same thing. The problem is they're doing it without God. So if we know how to separate their observations from their interpretations, we can replace their interpretations mm -hmm. with our own biblically-based interpretations, which is going to be ultimately more accurate anyway. So now let's, uh, let's go a step further. And here it gets interesting. Let's talk about quantum physics. And when you begin to talk about quantum physics and, and you read about these things in commentaries, in books, uh, in technical papers, to the extent that you have mathematical skills, maybe you read some math journals uh, and you discover, wow, science is, has really gone into some spooky corners these days. Uh, and I think Einstein actually used that term, spooky action at a distance to describe quantum physics. 
And, and so you read this and you say, can these things be true? Let's launch into that discussion for, for a moment. Sure. Yeah, and that was the question I had to constantly ask myself with all of this research. How? Because uh, we got to put the Bible first. We know right. that that's true. That's the Word of God. Um, we, we should even trust in that more than our own observations, more than what we see and what we can experience. So when I started to look at these things through a biblical lens, mm -hmm. uh, I realized that they actually, they do match up. When we have the correct interpretation of science and the correct interpretation of religion, they go hand in hand. Um, but yeah, a lot of the, the spooky things in, uh, in quantum physics, especially because like you mentioned, there are things like quantum entanglement, which uh, Einstein called spooky action at a distance. And Okay, we, I'm going to stop you right there. Somebody said quantum entanglement? Wait a minute. <laughs> Wait a minute. What does that mean? And really, there's a simple way to explain it, right? Sure. It's um, basically, it, it, physically, it should be impossible, but quantum entanglement is you have two particles and they can send messages back to one another at an absolute instant, faster than light. So if I'm holding a particle here and somebody uh, in the next room is holding another particle, mm -hmm. you're saying these two particles can interact even though they have seemingly have no connection. Yeah, yeah, and it's, an, it's at an absolute instant. You can have one particle on one end of the universe and one on the other end, and it'll still be at an instant. There's no time for the information to travel. So it's, it's seemingly physically impossible. Um, but it might have something to do with extra dimensions and things like that. So that's what that that's the mystery around quantum entanglement. Well, you know, when we read our Bible, all kinds of things happen in the Bible that shouldn't be able to happen. For example, the disciples after Jesus uh, was crucified, after he rose from the dead, went to heaven, uh, they were having a conversation in a room one day, and boom, he was there. Yep. Uh, and that shouldn't be able to, to happen. Now, physics today is beginning to verge into some of the explanations for why something like that is perfectly explainable. Yeah. In other words, the Lord was simply using the rules of physics to move from one place to another. Absolutely. And, you know, what we understand about physics, we're really on the precipice of understanding a lot of uh, things that are able to happen like that, miraculous things. And that doesn't at all take out the, the miracles that they are. Um, now we can look at how Jesus was able to appear in a room and understand that he was able to operate in a higher spatial dimension. Um, if he had access to that, that would have been no problem. But that doesn't at all take away from the absolute miracle that it is, because we certainly can't oh, do that. Yeah. <laughs> we can't even get our minds around a, a higher spatial dimension, let alone be able to operate in it. So it, it's, it's phenomenal. And, and yet, as Christians, we all look forward to the day when we'll have glorified bodies just as his body, and we'll be able to do these things routinely. Absolutely. Operating at a, if you will, a higher level of physics. And yes. Of course, he created physics, and he should know how to use it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's what this book is all about, quantum creation. If you've, if you've ever pondered some of the strange things that you read about in the Bible and say, I wonder how that could happen, this book will help you to think about these things. Now, I want to talk about the fourth dimension. Anybody who's been to a sci-fi movie or something you know, has heard the term the fourth dimension. Probably. Absolutely. Well, I'm reading here in Ephesians. <clears throat> <laughs> and I, you know where I'm going with this. <laughs> and I'm reading in Ephesians chapter 3, uh, starting in verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ. Well, that's a great, great urging, a great message, but wait a minute, uh, length, breadth, uh, depth, height, that's four dimensions. And they're spatial dimensions. And they're spatial dimensions. Talk about that a little yeah. bit. Yeah, we have four dimensions of space mentioned there, and what I love about it is it says it's for the saints to comprehend. Aha. Uh -huh. It's for us, you know, yes. and through the understanding of God and his creation, we can actually comprehend these things. Um <clears throat> 
there is a higher spatial dimension than the three that we currently live in. And there are a lot of physicists and scientists that say that time is the fourth dimension, and they, they are correct. It, it is the fourth dimension, but it's a temporal dimension. Uh, and I do get a little into that, into time in the book, um, but what I focus most on is the fourth spatial dimension, the fourth of space, and that's exactly what that passage is talking about. Uh, so what we're looking at is we, th there is a whole world, a whole existence out there that we can't perceive because we just have three dimensional perspective. You know, everything that, that we can experience can be plotted on the X, Y, and Z axis if we remember back to our middle school geometry. Um, the idea of a fourth spatial dimension is two new perpendicular directions off of that. We, we can't wrap our minds around that. That's true. Um, but that, that's what we're looking at, and I wanted to I wanted to really show in the book that while we may not be able to um, experience it, there there are tricks to be able to understand it, and in understanding that, that gives us just a wealth of information about God's creation, and it, it's it's so fascinating. <laughs> well, you know, some people have suggested that the fourth dimension is time, mm -hmm. and. Without time, certainly, we wouldn't have, if you will, time to exist. Right. If you cut time down to, the, to, the, to an infinitesimal nothing, theoretically, everything would disappear. Mm -hmm. So you need length, breadth, height, and time. And I've been uh, very much uh, interested in this in my own studies for years because the Bible deals with time. Yeah. God created time. He, said, he says in Isaiah 46, 9 and 10, I created the end from the beginning meaning I created the timeline. That's right. So he created time, and I believe, this is my own opinion, I believe that he created time in order to give things time to happen. <laughs> For example, in order to, to, to give the world time to understand that it needed a redeemer who came at a certain point in time, if you will. So God uses the timeline for redemption. And, and to me, that's a very intriguing thought. Now, you go a little bit deeper than, than that thought. You, you talk about what the physicists are doing today. What's of most interest to you right now? What's happening now that people should know about? Well, certainly everything that they're doing at CERN is, is of interest, and I try to keep up on that as much as possible because they're, they're actually taking particles, um, and, and well, we're, and they're going to be starting this up again at even more power than before, and they are creating these mini black holes, but what they're, what they're trying to find out is if some of these particles are escaping into extra dimensions, mm -hmm. and uh, they can see that... <clears throat> Certain particles, like if you look at the nucleus of an atom, uh, all the protons and neutrons, when, when we see a picture of it, it looks like a bunch of balls stuck together. But in reality, if we were actually able to observe it, those balls would be uh, popping in and out of existence, uh, doing all sorts of strange things. And it's because they're operating in higher spatial dimensions. Um, so certainly that's something to keep an eye on what they're doing at CERN. And, you know, they'll even admit they don't know exactly what you they're doing. You mentioned CERN. Now, that is a, uh, a particle accelerator. It's yeah. the biggest one ever built, an underground circular tunnel with, uh, with billions of dollars worth of electronic equipment. It accelerates uh, particles to practically the speed of light so that it can smash them together. It's what used to be called an atom smasher, I think. Yeah. But now they call it a particle accelerator. A lot of people are saying that science is poking into places that it shouldn't be poking its nose because yeah. it might upset the balance of reality. Yeah. So, yeah. and what do you think about that? <laughs> yeah, that's definitely true. And, and since they are, cre they're essentially creating doorways or, or, or portals to higher dimensions, uh, whether they realize it as that or not. Um, and sure, they may be minuscule to our perception but that doesn't mean that on the other end they are. <laughs> so yeah. they're, they're really messing with a lot of things that they don't fully understand, which could be dangerous. Could be dangerous. You know, we're, we're sitting here and we're talking today uh, about uh, science. And the, I, I think it's the lust, from my perspective at least, it's the lust of science to solve the riddle of creation. And I think a lot of scientists would like to take the position of God. They, they want to rise to levels of understanding that will enable them to, to if you will, to control the world. Mm -hmm. I think there are some bad motivations there. They yeah. deny the existence of God. And having done that, then they have to try to put them, themselves in the position of being little gods, if you will. And, yeah. and from that perspective, you really can't agree with what they're doing. 
but but from another perspective, and this is the perspective of your book, the Bible has a lot to say about what these men are doing today, their mm-hmm. discoveries and so forth. Yeah, it deals a lot in prophecy, and that you know that's another uh, fascinating aspect of this whole thing. I love Bible prophecy. And, and yes. So how does it do? How does your book delve into that? Let's go into that for a moment. Sure. Well, all of these all of these discoveries are leading to what is uh, sometimes called the singularity. Um, certainly, uh, they, they put a date on it at 2045, where technology and discoveries will reach a point that they just can't, they don't know what's going to happen after that. You know, we, we can look, we can kind of predict things a few years and, you know, new cell phones that are coming out or new computers. But when they start getting into things like quantum computing, which uh, actually deals with quantum entanglement, mm-hmm. uh, if they're able to... Uh, make that a reality uh, it 'll make our high speed internet look look slow as molasses <laughs> yeah I mean it will be at an instant and they 're talking about the creation of artificial intelligence, yeah, which might actually rule the world if you will yeah it 's a scary thought it, it is and, and especially you know you add that in with creating these portals at at uh with the large hadron collider, and it 's probably not going to stop there you know they 're going to keep progressing and progressing. Who knows what kinds of things are going to come through? And I, I believe the book of Revelation talks about that. Uh, Daniel talks about that. And I, I think we're, gonna, we're living in a time where all of these things are possible. And it, it's kind of a scary thought. But then at the same time, we know that we can rest assured in Christ. Uh, if, if we have our relationship with Jesus, we're with God where we need to be. He'll, he'll bring us through, but we still need to be prepared. You spend time reading the Bible as well as reading uh, the works of science. Absolutely, if not more so. I, you know, that, that's where our foundation needs to be, is in the Bible. You know, there are a lot of people out there who are probably saying right now, you know, I, I, I'd like to be able to read the Bible. I don't have the time. Uh, have, I might have an answer for you right here. If you'd like to listen to the Bible being read, I've got a, a New Testament on CDs. You just pop these into the CD player in your car or at home, and you can uh, get the new, the, the uh, King James Version uh, of the New Testament uh, read to you while you're doing something else. And you know what you'll find in, in, in the Bible, and it, particularly in the New Testament? You're going to find a lot about uh, why the Lord came. You're going to find out a, lot, out a lot about prophecy and, and how uh, the events of which we're watching today are coming together in a way that was foretold. And the story is right here. It's the truth. It's the New Testament on CDs. And uh, you can have it for a gift of any amount to skywatchtv.com. Just thought I'd throw that in there while we're talking. Now you have no excuse. (laughs) You can have the Bible read to you. Let's continue on now and get back to to your book. I'm going to hold it up again so that you can see it. Quantum Creation. if you had to describe this book in a couple of sentences, how would you describe it? Well, I would describe it as making science palatable for Christians and, and also showing the importance of looking at science through a biblical lens because we're really studying God's creation here. Let's talk about science and religion. Uh, some people would say science is uh, a kind of religion. Uh, there's a phrase in the New Testament where uh, I think Paul refers to science falsely so-called. In other words, he was talking uh, about, I think, what might have been Gnosticism, the belief that you can pursue God through scientific and philosophical principles. A- and a lot of people are doing that today. Yeah, a lot of quantum physicists are, are doing that as well. Um, they, they, their interpretations are drawn from things like Gnosticism, and you know now it's called New Age. Yes. Uh, but that goes back to interpretation versus observation. We don't need to take their New Agey Gnostic interpretations to be able to accept the reality of what's going on uh, at a quantum level. We can, we can strip those away because they're nonsense, and we can put our biblical interpretations on these things, and, and, it, and it fits way better. You know, what's odd to me is that a lot of people, particularly scientists, are willing to believe the most bizarre ideas, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth dimensions, you know, they're willing to believe all that, uh, 
but they doubt the Bible, the, the miracles of the Bible, mm -hmm. saying these are just old old tales told by shepherds around a campfire, and you really can't believe all that stuff. The Bible speaks about these things quite openly, uh, yeah. about the way the Lord travels uh, the, 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 in, a, in, a, in a chariot, of all things, called the Merkava Moftim, the chariot of wonder. And, and, and you say, wow, uh, God must be high tech. Well, he certainly is. Absolutely. And, and so what you're doing is you're taking, from a Christian point of view, you're simply showing how what science uh, is finding today actually confirms what's in Scripture. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why I say we need more Christian scientists out there to be able to apply the correct interpretations on these discoveries because right now it's dominated by atheists or even New Agers, uh, Gnostics, all, all, anything but Christian. There, there are a few Christian scientists out there, but they need to be the majority. We need, we need more Christians getting excited about science so we can get more Christian science, scientists out there giving us the right interpretations of these discoveries. A lot of people uh, have stated, uh, a, a lot of quote-unquote religious people over the, over the ages, uh, like the past couple thousand years, have, have said, in effect, yes, there was this person called Jesus. Uh, he was a spirit creature, really. He just came in spiritual form, and he appeared to be a man. He wasn't a real flesh and blood man. And then when he had done what he wanted to do, he went away, and you know, he just uh, evaporated or whatever. They don't want to allow uh, for the fact that God incarnated in human flesh, accomplished certain things within our time-space continuum, and then he, uh, according to prophecy, gave, him, gave up his life. Uh, he was actually physically killed, and then he was resurrected bodily. A lot of people have trouble wrapping their minds around that, and so they've kind of invented a spirit Jesus who, who only appeared to do those things. But you and I uh, believe that he actually did those things, that, he, that God incarnated in human flesh in this dimension. He accomplished, if you will, extra-dimensional things while he was here, and then he went back into another dimension. And by faith, we believe what the scientists are working very, very hard to prove <laughs> and, and they're building huge things like, like a, a particle accelerator over there in Switzerland to try to prove what you and I accept by faith. I think that's great, very ironic. Yeah. Yeah, and especially because they are trying so hard to do it without God. As you mentioned before, they're willing to look at all these strange things and accept those, but they won't touch God. They won't even consider it. And it's, it's frustrating because it's like, come on, guys, you're so close. <laughs> Just put God in there and you'll have it. And, but they won't do it. <laughs> they won't do it. And, well, why won't they do it? I want to sort of pull you off track and sure. ask you for your opinion. Well, I, I think it's because if they accept that there's a God, then they have to accept that there's somebody out there that they are held accountable to, meaning they can't do everything they want to do. <laughs> it's either just deny his existence yeah. or be disobedient to a God that, that they accept or accept God and accept his ways and become a Christian, basically. But if they do that, they won't be able to do everything that they want to do here in life. So that's a, that's a choice that they make every day. <laughs> but we find no conflict between scientific discovery and Christianity. And that's the ironic thing. There is no conflict. If they would realize that, they, they, they would be able to know that they can do what they, you know, I don't see any problem with uh, scientific discoveries and things as long as we do it within God's, uh, <laughs> within God's wishes. Um, so there really is no theological issue with that. But unfortunately, they want to be their own gods. So that, that's where their mindset is. You know, I, I thought at one point in our conversation, I would read the subtitle to your book. And it, the subtitle is A Scientific and Theological Journey Through Quantum Mechanics, Time, and the Fourth Spatial Dimension. If I had read that at the beginning of, of our get together here, you would have said, wow, this is not for me. <laughs> but now that you've heard what Josh has to say, uh, about quantum mechanics time in the fourth spatial dimension, you say, well, you know, that's not as far out as I thought it was. It, it really isn't. It's rooted in the scripture. It's rooted in the scripture and, and basically fairly understandable. Yes. Yeah. Like I said, it's, if I can understand it, I promise anybody can understand it. 
Well, Josh is is a, a writer uh, whom I respect because I've I've actually read through his manuscripts and they are readable. They pull you along. It's not like choking on scientific terms. <laughs> and, and I'm going to offer you the opportunity to get his two books, one called Quantum Creation, the other Cherubim Chariots, both for $29.95 uh, from, plus shipping and handling from skywatchtv.com. Skywatchtv.com. Uh, just order the Josh Peck package on skywatchtv.com. $29.95 for both these books is a, a great price for information that's at your fingertips, easy to read, easy to absorb. It's written in language that, uh, well, you've heard Josh talk. That's kind of the way it's written. It's a, it's a very, very down-to-earth, and yet it reaches into some places that uh, show you what's happening in the world today. And as Christians, I think we need to be educated. Uh, Josh. In fact, uh, I think the church is, is wanting right now, wanting some explanations for what in the world is happening. Yeah. And, and you're writing these things, but at a level where people can actually understand what's going on. Absolutely. Well, the things of God, they're, they're holy and magnificent, but they're simple. You know, God's um, attainable to everybody. And it's the same with science because when we have the biblical perspective, we realize science is from God and it should be understandable to everybody. Um, once we strip away all those terms and all those that scientific uh, jargon that, that scientists will use and just look at the concepts, and uh, that, that just blew my mind. Cause it's like, wow, the, my, my, my three-year-old daughter could understand this. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and by the way, Speaking of which, kids can often understand big concepts because they haven't uh, learned to confine themselves. So they're still wide open at their at their young ages, and and I think that's the way we all need to be. I think, in fact, that's a good way to approach the Bible, yeah. just with a complete openness and, and receptivity, uh, because there are concepts in the Bible that are so huge and yet so personal. Uh, you discover that, wow, I can have a close relationship with the God of heaven, and, and he'll share with me the secrets of creation. And uh, I think that's the spirit of your book, in a way. I mean, you are sort of like a little kid looking at things, you know, in the candy store, right? Well, we're to have faith like children. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, you have a closing word or two. We've got about 30 seconds here, and uh, this has been a great conversation. I've enjoyed talking with you. I'm excited about your pursuit of these subjects. Oh, it's exciting for me too. And I guess the main thing that I want to, I, I really want to make clear is that we put the Bible first. I, I, I certainly put the Bible first. I know you do. And even though we're talking about things like science, which the world says we can study without God, that's not the case. True science has to have God in there because that's the truth. So everything is from a biblical perspective. Amen. <laughs> Author Josh Peck. I think you'll enjoy his book. I'm Gary Stearman.